Welcome to Voices of Privacy, where we seek to provide you with the knowledge about information privacy so that you can make informed decisions about what to use, what to share, and everything else in the digital world. My name is Donna Wordelick, and I'm a professor of practice in the marketing department at the Pamplin College of Business at Virginia Tech, where I study research, data, marketing, and innovative technologies. My colleague is... My name is France Belanger, and I am a professor of information systems in the Pamplin College of Business at Virginia Tech. And I too teach, research, and write about information privacy and other technology topics. So Voices of Privacy has all kinds of materials. We have discussions, we have how-to videos. We also have interviews like this one we're gonna do today with experts on information privacy. These are people who have done research or projects trying to understand various aspects of privacy. We label these privacy talks. Today, our privacy talk guest is Robert Crossler. Rob is the chair of the Management, Information Systems and Entrepreneurship Department, as well as the Philip L. Case Professor of Information System in the Carson College of Business at Washington State University. Rob is also a colleague of mine, and we've written many papers on information privacy together. Rob, welcome to Voices of Privacy. Great, thank you, Franz. I am uh, so pleased to be here. Welcome, it's so nice to meet you, Rob. Really excited about today's discussion. Yes, thank you, it's a pleasure. So Rob, first of all, can you explain to us what contact tracing is? Yes, so contact tracing at the highest level is that ability to identify someone who has been in close proximity to you uh, when re they realize that they have become ill or have become sick. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the way this is often done was by asking someone, the doctor, the healthcare provider would say, okay, we need to get a hold of those people who may have been exposed to you. And you would list off the names of the, who those people were and they could be contacted. When COVID-19 became prevalent, one of the ways initially to really prevent this and try to cut down on the spread of this virus was to ramp up this ability to notify in a way that would be much more successful and much less likely to miss who those people were. And so to be able to do that, we utilized technology where people would have an app on a smartphone, a device they're carrying in their pockets all the time, and it would have the ability to share a, an anonymous number that was associated with that device and that device only with other people's devices. So then if you were diagnosed with COVID-19, you could tell your device, hey, I've been diagnosed. It would tell others without identifying who you were that you had been um, come down with this pandemic and they could then go and get tested and hopefully start uh, staying home, taking preventative actions to prevent people from being exposed to the virus uh, before it became uh, a spread of an issue. So when thinking about this, um, because I remember the COVID days and signed up and had my own app, right? So information from my phone was going back to my provider or healthcare providers to kind of track where I was in the system and to also record out, is, is that right? That, that's kind of what it sounds like at times, but that's not how it works. Um, the way it would work is that number would actually be sent through Bluetooth to someone else's device. So let's say you, myself, uh, and France were in a room together and we all were using this app is my identifier would be shared with both of your phones. Your identifiers would be shared with my phone. And then let's say the next day I'm at the doctor's office and you know it's I have COVID-19. And so then I would go onto my device and say, mm. I caught it. And then it would, my device would tell your device. It would send out a thing and say, for these numbers, let them know that uh, they potentially have been exposed. And so then you would find out, oh, in the last few days, I have been exposed to this. I may want to get tested. I may want to you know, work from home for a few days. And it would do so in such a way to where, A, my provider didn't know that it was me, nor did you know it was me, unless you're sitting there going, hmm, who was it that I was near that may have been that person, right? And then you try to piece things together. And, and whether or not I, I out myself and tell you, yeah, it was me or not, is then a, a very personal decision that I can make of my own. So, so Rob, basically, you're telling us that nobody was actually calling people and nobody was actually knowing who the other people were, correct? Correct. It was, it was protective of who the individuals were, and it was done 
straight up through the technology. You know, the old methods of, of how people did things um, was still being used where doctors would ask people and, and, and call them. So they didn't abandon that as one way, but this was a way that should have there been enough adoption of this technology, it had the potential to drastically cut down on the spread of this virus uh, in the midst of any other sorts of, of treatments and vaccines and so forth. So perhaps even in looking towards the future, hopefully based on the research that's been done, we'll get a larger adoption rate should hopefully never again this occur, but we know that history repeats itself. Um, and we were here a hundred years ago with the Spanish flu. So what did this, um, tell us a little bit more about the research and you know some of what you conducted, what was interesting, because I think most consumers don't consider this. And it was, you know, if you adopted you know, the app and had the messages going out to your network frequency, um, you know, and how many people still have that or being still tracked or what was your research all about? Yeah. So uh, this research was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, and we, what we endeavored to do is to look at the adoption and use of this, not only of just individuals, but how it was happening within a family. So we were looking at both parents and at teenagers. Um, and, and as a caveat that one of the things we found, which is part of the reason why it wasn't terribly effective, is there were not there was not wide scale adoption of this technology. So there there was not as much adoption as we would have hoped for. But even in the midst of of the those who did adopt it and those who did use it, we found uh, some interesting things. Um, one of which is, is your assumption in that the previous question you asked about you know my provider has it, they're able to track where I am, I'm at. We found that a lot of teenagers didn't want to use this sort of technology because they were afraid their parents were going to use this to track them and where they were going. And they're like, I want nothing to do with that, um, which, which at some level demonstrates a misunderstanding of what this technology was all about, which is one of those barriers of adoption and use of, of something of this nature is if people don't understand it, if they don't get it they're never going to use it in the first place, or they may be using it for wrong reasons, right? So on the flip side, if parents thought this is a great way to track their kids and where their kids have been, they might decide they're going to use it because it's one more parenting tool that they didn't know was available to them when in reality, that's not at all what this was. Um, so that, that, that lack of understanding may influence uh, how people think about these apps and what they might do to, to use them. You know, from a marketing perspective, it always starts, I think, definitely with education and trust and then interest, desire and action. So, you know, if it definitely if you know, if it's scaled, it's interesting because, you know, the, the way the lens of the kids are thinking about it versus where the parents even thinking about it from that perspective, I think it was more safety. So perhaps education or even tying in influencer, you know, influencers are saying, I, you know, I download the app because I want to know, I want to be in the know or something like that, like a kind of an interesting campaign that was attached to it. I wonder if you did some different testing, if that would have been a little bit more effective. It's interesting though, and at least you, it's been started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think as we go through and just finding out more of um, the outcomes and the trends, and I think people of different ages and, and stages are going to react differently. But for me in a classroom with a large number of students over 600, I would love for all of us to have the app and for it to just go out to everyone and me knowing that uh, 20 may have it and just to, to have that knowledge because we really didn't. So we were kind of going blindly and just masking up at that point. Yep. So Rob, we, um, you know, at Voices of Privacy, one of our key goal is to make sure everybody makes decisions that are informed, that they understand what's going on in terms of privacy and information that's being shared. And so, so if I interpret this in a certain way, it's that people were concerned about privacy, in, but it was because they didn't understand how the apps work. Is that correct? Is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. I, I think we did see those results um, in, in the data that we collected, that um, a lack of understanding of privacy. So privacy was having an impact. People were considering that, but sometimes considering it with incorrect knowledge. Um, we, we did see differences in, in people's concerns over privacy related to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the apps that were being used to, to help them. Um, but, but mostly, um, and, and I say this showed, showed up mostly in our qualitative comments where we asked people about their concerns and so forth, showed up about 10 to 20% of the people, depending if we're talking to parents or children, 
about that being an aspect that they were concerned about the use of, of an app such as this. Rob, oh, sorry, go ahead, Donna. Oh no, I just I just think it's interesting because you know thinking about further segmentation and breaking it down, you know, and where different parties, right, and, and how they viewed it, or different ethnicities, um, trust level factors, or where people were in terms of their life stage and where they were living, and the likelihood more to you know trust elders or wherever. So I just I think it's fascinating from a psychological perspective, um, but also where the you know the country is and you know, the understanding of it or the, the belief and um, how that could impact usage of the app as well. Absolutely. And I was going to ask something kind of related to that. And it's the idea of, of why you ask teenagers and parents and um, in the main differences, I mean, um, other than that they didn't understand what they were doing, but was there a particular goal in trying to, you know, look at teenagers versus their parents and their attitudes in this case? Yeah, so so it was, there's a couple of things that we were hoping to accomplish. One is inside of a family unit, the, the decision of one person inside of a household has an effect on others. So if one person believes that they're going to use this app and they start using it, other family members are generally together when they go out, when they do things. So it has a cascading influence, even if not everyone has decided they're going to use this. Uh, we also were curious if one person deciding it and having attitudes towards it, if their beliefs and how they thought about things was shared throughout the family, or if this actually created some sort of a tension in the midst of, you know, what was a chaotic situation in the world, did these differences in how we were going to share information about ourselves individually create additional tensions within the family? So, Rob, these concerns that you reported on, um, I assume they were all throughout the United States? Yeah, so we collected data very specifically uh, across the entire United States. We had respondents from almost every state uh, in the country um, and ultimately from every region. We, we weren't able to get guaranteed from, from every state with the data we collected, but we had every, every region um, covered fairly equally, uh, fairly equal percentages. And we didn't find a whole lot of difference across the, the country. That, that We tried to break it down by states that maybe were more right leaning versus left leaning how could we try to you know parse these regions into things because we didn't um have enough in each of them i, I think we had some power issues where we couldn't detect um stuff if it was there because we had you know two or three in each state so, so we didn't necessarily have enough data to get to that level of granularity but interestingly we did find that um, from a familiarity perspective which is a big aspect of getting people to use the app is they have to be aware of it they have to be familiar with it so is that men were oftentimes more familiar with this than women were. Mm -hmm. And also that people, um, the Caucasians, were more familiar with it than people were of color. And, and, and part of the news narrative was we were not as a society doing a good job of ensuring that the knowledge of how to prevent and protect yourself from COVID-19 was getting into every um, aspect of society. And so our data did reveal that, you know, from a familiarity perspective, that there were certain populations that were not receiving the information or at least feeling like they'd received the information that we had been trying to do uh, from a governmental level. So I have just two um, thoughts or questions. Um, first, it's interesting, the male versus female, because usually females are the decision makers in the house and sometimes more informed, although that has changed within the last decade or so. It's a little bit more evened out. So that's a surprise. Um, and secondly, were, did you see any differences in cities that were, or areas that were, let's say, saturated with COVID, like M Manhattan, New York City, that they would be more apt to try the app versus other areas like Blacksburg, where it didn't really grow as quickly? Yeah, as, as I poked at the data and, and, and looked at the data from a number of different angles, I honestly did not see any differences based on, on states and locations. Um, and again, it could have been because I had 10 respondents from the, the state of New York, and I didn't know exactly where at they were in New York, right? Were they, you know, in a part of the state that, that weren't exposed as much as they were, say, in Manhattan? Um, were there some differences there? Um, great questions. I would love to have the data to be able to answer them because um, I, I think that may have been the case. Um, as far as the men versus women, one of the, 
the things that I wondered during this was the outreach mechanisms and what we relied upon. Um, I saw a lot of television commercials, um, but I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, it just so happened that when I was watching TV, I noticed these commercials. And, and I wondered, um, are we at a point in society where we want to disseminate the need to do something from a health perspective that getting information to people needs to happen in much more creative ways than perhaps relying on the, the standard public service announcements that we'd have uh, through your traditional um, radio or television ads. I completely agree in terms of just unique strategies and ways um, to reach out to the public. And we found years ago, you know, everyone was so conditioned to your schools are closed, it's winter, we'll call, all of that sort of stuff. And then a couple of um, parents, and I was one of them, that started to post it on a Facebook or something along those lines. And then I had even some parents say, we'll wait for the phone call. And now they've been, now they're used to it. They're used to seeing all of that. So I wonder if there are some more creative ways in which a strategy and marketing and even different messages to different areas could really assist in the education and the adoption. Right. And, and, and one of the things we did see about familiarity is older people were more familiar than younger people were, which I, I think part of that is, is the public service announcements were, um, being received by people through those mediums that, that was targeted more at that older population, which may have been intentional because they're the ones most at risk during all of this and, and so forth. But um, so, somewhat interesting that oftentimes when it comes to technology, younger people are ahead of the game when it comes to that than older people are. So the fact that older people were more familiar than, than the younger people was, was somewhat surprising. That Definitely is surprising because we've you know talked a lot about the differences in age and we call it the digital divide, the age divide, and you know how the younger people are more apt at technology. But at the same time, um, if you look at the you know your overall conclusion, and I'll kind of bring back privacy a little bit here. Um, so privacy matters, and people are concerned about sharing all of this information about you know who they're with, where they go, things like that. Um, and yet in this case, me who always brings up the issues of privacy and location tracking, and we talk a lot about that in our episodes, um, in this case, it really should not have been an issue, right? Yeah, it, th this app was designed to where privacy should not have been an issue, but well, yeah, it came down to people's understanding of information and how it is being shared and who it is being shared with. And when the understanding of the truth is lacking and you have a different understanding, you ultimately make decisions that might not be best aligned with really what privacy would tell you um, your decisions should be. Um, so, so it really does suggest to developers of apps, um, developers of technology that, that clearly communicating the role and how information is being captured, shared, stored, and so forth is important. So that way people can make informed decisions. But also as consumers, it's important for you to take the time to understand the truth around how your data is being stored and used. So when you're making that decision, you're not doing it based on faulty assumptions and perhaps making a decision inconsistent with how you would with a correct understanding of that information. Donna, I think that's a good plug-in for Voices of Privacy. We, I don't want to frighten you, but I think we're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, we can help. That's exactly why Voices of Privacy was created, honestly, to be more consumer-facing and transparent and really a simple, easy-to-use platform where they could learn and then they could apply things that would empower them to at least protect their future digital journey, as we say. Bronx, this is incredible. I could probably talk about this and bring Rob on every single week to complete, to really, really understand it. I love the way he broke down his research and really made it consumer friendly. So we really could understand. And if we can have part of this to help consumers worldwide, this is huge. Yeah. I think one of the key insight for me is that it's about people understanding um, the sharing of information, the how the information is used, and the technologies. And so we don't get enough information about that. And to me, if we did, um, we probably could make different decisions about all kinds of different technologies. So it's very important to understand. I think Rob made that point pretty clear. 
And I absolutely think in terms of the distribution of where these messages are being put out to different groups and genders, there's so much more. And that's where I think marketing plays a valuable role in being able to understand throughout messaging or even just pure education um, and exactly what we're doing, but in the world that not every location-based tracking is bad, especially when it's for your life. And as we always say, remember, you cannot erase what has been shared in the digital world, but you do have decision power over your future digital journey. Thank you.